there's so much we'd love to be able to say and uh, deal with in regard to uh, the kingdom, etc. And there's a lot of confusion uh, in regard to what is the church, what is the body of Christ, what is the family of God, what is the kingdom. And uh, the when we look at, you know, as I mentioned, uh, in, in jurisprudence, kingdom law, you have to follow several things. Number one, text. That's the Word of God. That's the doctrine. You follow the historical account. If we believe in succession, we have to go into history and see what our forefathers believed. And if they believed according to the Scripture, then we can align ourselves in a successional format to them. And uh, so you have, uh, then you have the precedent. You know, things of precedent that were set. Now that's how you're going to determine uh, in a, uh, the jurisprudence of kingdom law. And we, we look at different men, and, and you think of uh, different uh, historians in the country when Baptist history came on the scene and the purpose why Baptist history became so important. When we understand, uh, such as uh, in America, the first uh, Baptist historian technically would be um, a man by the name of Comer. And uh, he, uh, he compiled information on Baptist succession and the history of Baptist people and who they were. And when he died, um, uh, th then, then uh, there was a man uh, back during the uh, Revolutionary War period, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm, uh, it's uh, Bacchus, Isaac Bacchus, and then David Benedict uh, received his notes, and then from Benedict, uh, the notes of that Baptist history went all the way to uh, J.R. Graves, and after the passing of J.R. Graves, the Baptist history notes uh, then went to J.T. Christian. Now, if you've never re uh, have read much on Baptist history, you need to. And again, th this is dealing with precedent. It's dealing with what our Baptist forefathers believed and connecting us in this uh, perpetuity of, of history. And when you look at the verse behind us here, uh, throughout all ages, the world without end. And so the church never went underground and was out of business. There was always a New Testament church. And, and of course, what makes a New Testament church, obviously, you've got to be saved. And then you have to have biblical baptism, and, and that is not, not only in the mode and not in the name only of the Trinity, but it's, it also needs to be uh, with proper authority, and there's only one proper authority that came, and that was from God to John. And, and that, of course, to Christ's church, and, and so as John was sent from God to baptize and churches were started with that baptism, there has to be a succession. Amen. It's only logical. There has to be. Because there's only one church, and you read that scripture, what in the book of Galatians, where it talks about uh, Jerusalem, uh, which answers to, answers to us all, that is the mother of us all. What he's talking about there, that the first church was in Jerusalem, and she's the mother of all New Testament churches that came out of her. And that's what he's referring to there. And uh, so we look at, you know, some of the things that our forefathers believed, and, um, you know, something happened in the country uh, when the civil, you know, the civil war was one of the things that decimated the country. And uh, churches were destroyed, and meeting houses were emptied out, and, and uh, learning facilities weren't there as they were from the Sandy Creek Revival. And, and then, of course, the Tiff and discovery of the uh, Westcott and Hort text, as it later was called, and new Bibles came on the scene. And then you had the origin of the species uh, by Darwin. And, and then we had uh, one thing that happened was called the Wissett Controversy in the 1890s. And uh, this is one thing that spurned a lot of uh, Baptist history uh, that came on the scene where men like Shackelford and D.B. Ray and J.R. Graves and J.T. Christian, and uh, no one has traveled more than J.T. Christian across uh, the, the ocean and gone into Europe to get actual documentation of our Baptist forefathers in history. We have uh, historians even in England, uh, you know, we think of uh, the different ones that uh, wrote for us there. And, uh, but we look in this country, and uh, the Wissett controversy, what that was, if you don't know, uh, the Wissett controversy that took place in the 1890s was that Wissett, who was uh, teaching in the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, I believe in Lysington, Kentucky, uh, he, was, he was teaching that Baptist uh, did not come into existence until uh, 1641. And uh, that's when Baptist uh, came into existence, and that was being taught in schools. Well, then you have, um, you know, the Carroll brothers, B.M. Carroll, J.M. Carroll. You have the Trail of Blood. You had J.T. Christian Shackelford and others that even wrote Baptist history before that, uh, proving and dealing with our succession that uh, we, the, the Church of Jesus Christ 
uh, never went out of business, and uh, they deal with the baptism issue. And, and so the, the Wissett controversy was a big controversy, and that kind of went off to one direction where a lot of churches today teach that. Uh, they, they think that Luther is the one that brought it all back to life, and the Baptists came out of that and dealing, connecting us with the Munzer Madmen there in, in Germany. But um, there's some that, uh, that, that held to the, the Baptist principles that uh, depends on what historian you want to read. And of course, there's going to be two lines of history as there's two lines of uh, text of the Bible. If you want the West Scott and Hort text or the text of Receptus, you've got to make a choice. And if you want the true line of Baptist history, you can follow Wissett's men and his theology, or you can find the, follow the, the Baptist uh, teaching of Comer and Bacchus and, and uh, Benedict and uh, you know, J.R. Graves and, and these men. And also, there's going to be two lines of baptism. You know, you're going to have uh, the two different ones, and you're going to have the baptism of John Crowd. Then you'll have the baptism of uh, the Wissid, the Wissidites, and those who simply believe in a mode is sufficient. And so, you're going to have this controversy you're dealing with. And I believe uh, God is in the business of resetting some things. And every hundred years, historically, you'll find around that time, there's always been a resetting among God's people in our churches. And it wasn't always this way. In 1851, there was a thing called the Cotton Grove Resolution. And uh, that was uh, uh, under the a man they called Mr. Baptist. His name was J.R. Graves. He was instrumental in uh, preventing the apostasy of Baptist churches in the South. And it was during this uh, time of the 1850s, what J.R. Graves experienced with the baptism of his mother, and how baptism uh, was being uh, treated so lightly, and people not understanding what it was. Uh, but God began to reset some things. In 1851, there was something called the Cotton Grove Resolution. There was 10 resolutions that were made among those Baptists there in, in Tennessee. And, uh, and, uh, and Pendleton, James Madison Pendleton, he also was one of them. Uh, that was a good friend of J.R. Graves. He is from the north, and J.R. Graves is from the south, but they were good friends. And uh, I'm going to read you something that um, uh, Pendleton said he wrote in his book. Now, he wrote a booklet called, uh, 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 I believe it was called, um, uh, the, he, uh, the, Defenders of Baptist, the Defenders of the Baptist Faith, and he wrote a little booklet called Remove Not the Ancient Landmarks. And uh, he wrote, and it dealt with the subject of baptism because back during this time, you had men like Presbyterians coming in and standing in pulpits of Baptist churches, and they were preaching behind Baptist churches. And, and he said these are unbaptized ministers allowing to come in and teach God's people. And even as uh, what Brother uh, Orlando was saying, uh, that uh, how that uh, receive not them into your house that they have not this doctrine. You know, if a person comes in, they don't have biblical baptism. They don't have a, they don't have a right to stand behind the pulpit. And to teach, and that's that's the whole concept behind what landmarkism stands for, and what Pendleton was trying to say, and uh, he 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 expounded on that in the scriptures dealing with the two words uh, in the Bible, and how that Jesus Himself would not even preach until He had the baptism of John, and and so th this is an important the distinction of what the Cotton Grove Resolution brought forth. So we're not starting this. We're trying to get back to it and reset it Amen. and trying to understand some things. And then people will call us briders, and they don't even know what a brider is. Yeah. And they'll call you those kind of names, and um, you know they call you all kinds of things. It seems like when the defense is weak, they always go to name calling. Yeah. And uh, they do that. And uh, so, uh, but let me read you something that Pendleton said. And by the way, if you ever get a chance, there's a book written by a man by the name of Nivens, uh, it's on baptism. I.K. Cross's book on Baptist history or heritage abandoned. It's a good book, and, and these you can get a download on PDF off the internet. But I.K. Cross, uh, read his book. Uh, he, he has a lot of good information in that. He was a Southern Baptist historian who was writing the encyclopedia for the Southern Baptists in the eight, uh, in the 1950s, and they wouldn't have anything to do with him. But he, uh, he mentions how that in 1939 in the Southern Baptist periodicals that, uh, you know, the, the Sunday school quarterlies, uh, they had in there those quarterlies in 1939 that uh, spirit baptism was heresy. And, uh, then, and then, uh, then they become a little more warm to it around in the uh, uh, 1950s. In 1963, they embraced that doctrine, the convention did. Not all Baptist churches are the Southern Baptists, but they embraced in 1963 officially the convention embraced the universal baptism and saying this, that everyone that is saved is baptized by the Spirit into the family of God, and they're all part of a big mystical church. And that's what they added to. But yet before that, and what I.T. Cross brings out, was the abandonment of our Baptist heritage 
and how did they become Protestantized, and that's the problem today with the Southern Baptist Convention. That's one of the problems, I should say. But the, the, I believe it was in 18... Um, uh, it was in the 1850s. There was a meeting in Niagara Falls, New York with the Presbyterians. Now, Niven's book brings this out. If you get a chance, too, to read The Trilemma by J.R. Graves, get that book. Uh, it's tremendous. Write these names down. Look them up. I could send you the book if you'll ask for them. I'll mail them to you, and I won't charge you for them. We just want to get the material out. But he, deal, he, record, he mentions this actual thing that took place. Uh, the Presbyterians met in Niagara Falls, New York. And when they met together, the topic of the papacy came up and the ordinations of the papacy and the baptisms of the papacy. And they said that the papacy is the Antichrist and that his ordinations are null and void and his baptisms are null and void. And they wanted to vote uh, to reject any baptisms or ordinations of the papacy. And they brought it up among themselves and said, well, if we do that, we have to do it to ourselves because we are from them. Amen. And uh, that kind of brought a holy hush over the congregation. They said, well, we're going to table this. And they, kept, they left it on the table, never did anything with it thereafter. Right. But the point being made, they're from that group. Now, they're non-baptized. They have no right to stand behind our pulpit. But yet in Baptist churches today, if Billy Sunday was reincarnated, he would be booked solid yeah. for the next 300 years. Standing at Baptist pulpits, never being biblically baptized. The same with D.L. Moody. And what Brother uh, Pastor Orlando was saying, that if any come unto you not having this doctrine, receive them not into your house. But yet we will throw that aside and ignore the Word of God for the sake of popularity. But let me read you something that Pendleton wrote, James Madison Pendleton. And uh, he was in the 1850s with J.R. Graves during the resetting. He said, another thing follows, the official acts of the Pudo Baptist preachers have no validity in them. They, their falsely so-called baptisms are a nullity. Immersions administered by them ought to be repudiated uh, by Baptists. How is it? Pudo Baptist ministers are not in the visible kingdom of Christ. And notice he uses the visible kingdom. See, these men understood the kingdom, the church being the divine depository of the kingdom, which is laws and ordinances and authority. When Jesus said, all power is given unto me, he was talking kingdom power, that on earth there is a power, a governmental power, that rests within the embassies of his churches, that we go forth and preach. We have the authority. No government can say, no, if they do, we go anyways, and we still preach the gospel. And we baptize and we teach. And the visible kingdom. And so he said, they, uh, he said that they, uh, their reputity... Um, uh, by, they ought to be reputed by Baptists. How is it the Pudo Baptist ministers are not in the visible kingdom of Christ? How then can they induct others into it by baptism? Now keep this in mind. Do you know that Bible churches came from Presbyterians? Amen. And Bible churches simply, they're Baptistic, but they'll change their name to Baptist and you take their baptism. Yeah. And it came from, just as the Presbyterians would say about the, 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 the papacy, their baptisms are corrupt. Well, so is theirs, but they tabled it. Sounds like we're doing the same thing, doesn't it? Yep. We're tabling it because we'll have Bible church people that came out of Presbyterians in the 1930, and they were part of the organization and construction of that movement, as well as the social brethren. And how I know a pastor back up in Michigan that I've known for years. The social brethren is a group that was started by... Uh, you know, the Protestants, and uh, they offer baptism by, you know, immersion or, or effusion or sprinkling. And uh, they're mostly in Illinois, and they moved into Michigan in the Pontiac, Detroit area. And uh, one of these pastors was ordained, baptized as a social brethren. And what he did, he did it, he took a wand and he went out to his sign, put letters up, and waved the wand over it and said, Now I'm Baptist. I'm kidding about the wand. But he magically became Baptist, but on his office wall is his ordination from the social brethren, and his, he was baptized by the social brethren, and he became the president of Midwestern Baptist College, Dr. Tom Malone. And, the, and, and people up there, churches are receiving their baptism out of Shalom Baptist Church. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gossiping, I'm telling the truth. And the thing is, I was raised in that area. 
I knew Brother Malone, and uh, my family knew Brother Malone when he started the work. My dad and Brother Tom Malone were good friends. My sister was best friends with his son, Tommy. And so I'm not some outsider looking in. And my mother was baptized by a Presbyterian and went and joined Emmanuel, and they took her baptism. And this is what happened to J.R. Graves when he looked in regard to his mother, and the same thing took place, and how that uh, her baptism by Presbyterian, and, and how this affected J.R. Graves, and how he realized something was not right. And so he began to examine some things, and he began to call people on the carpet about this and bring these truths out. And this is why Baptist history was studied, and how that they died over baptism. That's what the martyrs died from. Amen. They didn't die over the virgin birth, or they didn't die over blood atonement. They didn't die over any of that. They died over baptism. Right because they would not accept the baptism of these pedo-baptists. But continuing what uh, Pendleton said, he said, Would it not be a violation of all government um, analogies to allow these to act as officers of a kingdom who are not citizens of that kingdom? So here it is. You have the pedo-baptist ministers. They're not even part of a New Testament church, but yet their baptism is bringing people into something they're no part of. And that's what Pendleton was saying. And then further it says that they're no part of, he said, um, it would be argued that in a case of necessity, an irregular act is not in, in, uh, does not uh, invalidate an act. As to immersion by pedo baptist preachers, uh, there is no necessity and never was. There are Baptist ministers enough who administer, will administer baptism, so really there's no necessity. And by the way, necessity has no law, and that's how people think. I was asking a Baptist historian that talked about uh, Baptist history, but yet he was, a, he, he was a Protestant in his belief system. And I threw up an analogy. I said, well, let's say, for instance, there was a man up in Alaska living in a village. He couldn't get out of the village. And he was listening to the radio, and he got saved. And he started reading his Bible. And he realized he needed to be baptized. I said, so he has somebody baptize him like... Uh, a Roger Williams, and he turns around and baptizes that other man, and they all start baptizing converts in that village. I said, uh, are those baptisms legitimate? He said, well, under those conditions, I guess it would be, but normally no. This is where necessity has no law. You see, we violate based on the need. We go ahead and change. Now, necessity has no law is a quote by Benjamin Keach in the glory of a true New Testament church. He deals with the subject of baptism. 1647, I think it was. He wrote that, uh, in, and I'll, I'll mention it in a minute, uh, but he wrote uh, The Glory of a True Church, and it was, it was a manual dealing with church discipline. It was in, um, uh, printed in London in uh, 16, uh, maybe it was 97. But yet what we find is that Pendleton further on goes to say, he said there are no Baptist. He said that there are, uh, there are Baptist ministers enough to administer baptism, and they love to do it. It is high time for those who uh, ridicule immersion and yet perform it, rather than lose a valuable member, to be uh, discontinuanced. They deserve the content of all honorable men. They are willing, for selfish and sectarian purposes, to perform the act in the name of the sacred three and yet make light of that act such as men I leave in the hands of a merciful God. You know, there's Baptist preachers today that say, you know, what you all are doing here is a little cultic, you know, but yet they'll go ahead and baptize. They'll take that Protestant baptism for sectarian purposes. They'll never rebaptize. but we'll bring you in. We don't want to lose you. That's exactly what he's saying here in regard to the Presbyterian. We, the only difference here is that we, it's the name. Baptist, now it was Presbyterian. Now Baptist doing the same thing Presbyterians yeah. did back in the Niagara Fall meeting in, in the, uh, the mid-1800s. So things have changed. And I want to share just a little bit with you in regard to, and I, and I really am going to try to be brief. I'm going to give you just some, uh, some cold hard facts here. But another misunder, a misnomer, and uh, I was going to try to sing a song tonight, I didn't get prepared to do it, but uh, th there's, a, there's a song that's sung. It's a real happy song, and, uh, but it's an unscriptural song. And if I were to sing it to you, I think you all would like it, not the way it's sung, but just the song itself. And, and it deals uh, with a mysticism 
uh, and, and people accept it. And it's about, I'm living up there in the heavenly fair on the right hand of the Father. And, and it talks about being up there. And, uh, well, it goes something like this. Well, I took a look in the old black book and it thrilled me through and through. If you've been saved and born again, it's bound to thrill you too. I was reading along about going home and I found to my surprise. Um, got coming to me here. I found to my surprise. I'm already there in Jesus. There's a waiting on the other side. I'm already over on the other side waiting on my brand new body. I'm living up there in the heavenly fair on the right hand of the Father. My citizenship's in heaven. I'm a living in Christ, you see. I'm already there in Jesus. There's a waiting on my body to be. That's a good song, isn't it? But it's unscriptural. We're not up there. We're here. Now, now there's a... Um, I hope you don't play that on the recording there. You do have an editor, all right? <laughs> okay, and uh, it's, uh, you do. I hope you do edit. All right, but that that will be the humility of my life. All right, I'm already turning three shades of red, and but I wanted you to understand the song. It's a happy tune, and uh, it was written by a farmer, and uh, it's a happy tune. You say I'm already up there living on the other side. You know, it's a happy tune, but it's not Bible. And you girls can laugh now. Right. So um, we we see here dealing with. The Bible talks about the, the subject of heavenly places. And I, want, and I want to speak to you about heavenly places. Where is heavenly places? But before I do, I mentioned about Benjamin Keach. Now, his son Eliakim Keach is a unique individual. Amen. And uh, he came over to the Americas. Now, his father pastored here, but his son did not profess salvation. And to get uh, free passage, he presented himself as a minister. And as a minister, he was on the ship, and so people wanted sermons, and so they said, hey, you being you're a preacher, you weren't even saved, preach to us. And so he did, and he got under conviction and got saved listening to his own preaching. And uh, he, he uh, became a pastor in Philadelphia, and he became one of the signers of what we know as the Philadelphia Confession of Faith. And uh, that was a confession of faith that began to be the glue of, uh, of holding the churches together as a, as a faith practice in the colonies and, and so forth. And, uh, and so uh, th that's, uh, and, and by the way, Keech is the one that got music in the church and uh, where you could have music. And uh, that was part of the, the, uh, the confession of faith. The Keeches were involved in that, where the singing in the church and music. And uh, so, uh, but we do find that uh, he wrote in his father, now Benjamin Keach, who was a pastor in London and a very influential man of the seven churches there in London. Uh, it was called The Glory of a True Church and its discipline displayed wherein the true gospel church is described together with the power and of the keys who are to be left in and who are to be shut out by Benjamin Keach. And he mentions Matthew 18, 18, whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. So he's talking about He's talking about uh, uh, jurisprudence of kingdom law. And he's dealing with the discipline of the church and the things that take place. And I want to read this. And uh, he, it deals with the administration of government within the church and the proper way to do it. And it's a very good uh, read. If you get it, you could download it. It's called The Glory of a True Church by Keech. I taught it to our people. It's a great document to go through. And uh, we went through it. And, uh, but he said this, and, and what the point I want to get to and how he looked at it, he said this in regard to the church. He said, and when admitted members before uh, the church, they must solemnly enter into a covenant to walk in the fellowship of that particular congregation and submit themselves to the care and discipline thereof and to walk faithfully uh, with God in all his holy ordinances. And there to be fed and have communion and worship with God, uh, worship God there. When the church meets, if possible, to give themselves up to the watch and charge of the pastor and ministry thereof, the pastor then also signifying in the name of the church their acceptance of each person and endeavor to take care of them and to watch over them in the Lord, the members being first satisfied to receive them, the members are satisfied to receive them and to have communion with them, and so the pastor to give them the right hand of fellowship of a church or he calls church organical. Now there's a phrase he uses there. He says the church organic. 
Now, I mentioned that every time when you look in the Scripture, what you'll find, when God deals with man, He deals with him on an organic basis. It's, it's uh, organic-based. When God deals with man, He met with man on Mount Sinai. God came to the garden. God planted a garden here. He made a man here. God made him alive here. Jesus Christ came here. He came seeking us. God deals with us in organic fashion. His church is here organically, and so is His kingdom. And it's here. It's not up there. We're not up there. Everything is here. Now, there's a phrase in the Bible that, that mentions as heavenly places. And we look at the word uh, heavenly, if we could use the word. The word heavenly simply means, according to the, this definition, heavenly refers to where the subject in question is from. The origin and its nature determine if it's heavenly regardless where it is found, it remains heavenly. So it is where you are from, and the characteristics determine if you are heavenly or not. And so Christ was from heaven, but where was He found? Organically. He was found here. He came down from heaven. He said that to Nicodemus. He came down from above. And so we look at heavenly does not determine where it is found. It determines where it is from. And that's what we have to understand, the heavenly. And it's important that we do that because... The, this, the, 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 I believe the apostasy that's caused a lot of this um, uh, falling away, if you will, is because of the mysticism ideology that we have, that the church is mystical and the church is invisible, as well as the baptism is uh, mystical and invisible. And uh, we, we see that that happens. And uh, so let's look here, if you will. Let's uh, take our Bible, go to the book of Ephesians. Now, when you go to the book of Ephesians, this book is dealing with ethnic diversity there within the church. In chapter 1, when Paul is writing to the, the church of Ephesus, he is speaking to them. He's addressing them. And then in chapter 2, he, he mentions uh, in regard to the twain becoming one, removing the middle wall of partition that divided in the court of the Gentiles uh, from the court of men and women. And there was a wall that divided them. He said that wall is broken down, the middle wall of partition. He said the twain, the Jew and Gentile, become one. And that's why there's, uh, there's one body in that context of the church of Ephesus. And so he's, he's dealing with the ethnic division there. And he said, we're built together, we're laid upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, built up uh, into a holy temple in the Lord, and uh, the twain become one. And so he's dealing with the ethnic divisi uh, division there, the, um, you know, the, the, the prejudicial separation that was there. And so in reality, when you come into the kingdom, everyone's equal. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew, Gentile, we're all equal. We come in, we, we're, we're naked before God before we come in, and every allegiance is left behind. doesn't matter how wealthy you are, who you are, what kind of a name you have, you come in, you sit down just like everybody else, no big shots, everyone's the same. Amen. Male and female, uh, Greek, uh, Jew, doesn't matter. We're all equal in His kingdom. Now, I know there are certain things that God has said in regard to the teaching of His Word, but we have to understand that uh, just because you are of a different nationality or a different race, it doesn't make you better or worse than anybody else. And so he mentions this, and uh, we see in verse uh, 3 of chapter 1, it said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, if you understand the definition, heavenly is not where it is found, uh, but where it is from. So heavenly places. Now, Christ was from heaven, but He was found here. Now, heavenly places we look at as the New Testament church, just as the baptism of John. Was it of heaven or was it of men? What kind of baptism do we have organically? It's, it's, it's organic baptism, but it's heavenly, right? And so the baptism of John, is it of heaven or is it of men? Therefore, it has to be heavenly baptism. And, and so yet it is exercised and practiced here organically. And we see in verses uh, 20, if you'll look there, he said, which, uh, which he wrought in Christ when he had raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now here we also see that not only where it's from, uh, but yet it resides in heaven. But yet that doesn't mean we're in heaven. We have to understand that heavenly places, although it will, it will direct both places, but yet it is still where it is from, and it is heavenly. So we can continue on. Go to chapter 2, if you will, in verse 6. We're just going to go right through the book of Ephesians here, look at several verses. In chapter 2, verse 6, 
He hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, that song that I, that I butchered and I sang, that's what this song is based on. I'm sitting up there in the heavenly fair at the right hand of the Father. That's what that song is saying. And so it's based on this, but totally misunderstood. Now, when I look here and I read in chapter 2, verse 6, and it's raised us up together, what's that referring to? Raising us up together. Well, if we go to Romans chapter 6, let me just turn there. You can turn there if you like. But Romans chapter 6, and this is a wet baptism, by the way. Yeah. It's wet. And, uh, I mean, it's H2O. It's water. In Romans chapter 6, he says what, uh, in verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, the like as Christ was raised up by, uh, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. And so this is dealing with the raising up. And you'll read there in the book of Colossians where it talks about baptism in chapter 2. Uh, go to Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, we see where he is talking about baptism here. In Colossians 2, and uh, we'll pick up here in verse... Um, All right, let's go ahead and, and pick up here in verse uh, 9. For in him dwelleth uh, the, all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And uh, that's an important thing to hold on to, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. And uh, whom also you are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And so this is being raised up. He's talking about wet water here, being raised up, and how this is baptism. And baptism is the membership protocol that places us into a New Testament church, all right? So what we see, he's saying here in the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter uh, uh, 2 in verse 6, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places. So if the baptism of John is heavenly, practiced organically, the church that Jesus Christ, which is from heaven, started, he started the heavenly institution, which you know is the New Testament church, but practiced organically. Therefore, if we have the baptism from heaven, we are placed in an institution of heaven, even though it is organically based here on this earth. So we are seated together in heavenly places. That's what he's saying. And so the New Testament church is the heavenly place. Let's go to Ephesians 3, verse 10. To the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now remember what I said to you there in, uh, in the book of uh, Colossians 2. You want to turn back there, but keep your place in Ephesians. Go back to uh, Colossians 2, verse uh, 10. He said, And you are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, and, and, and uh, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. You know, circumcision, you know what that is? Circumcision, whether physical uh, or, or whatever, it is always the casting away of the filth of the flesh. The foreskin of the male child, the casting away, that's what it is. It's not what's left behind, but what's cast away. And Moses uh, even told the children of Israel, he said, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, cast it away. The, the, the works of the flesh, cast it away. And that's what circumcision means. And when you read here in the book of Colossians chapter 3, we know as, you know as well as I, before a person is scripturally baptized, they stand in the water dead to sin. This is the circumcision where they have cast away the works of the flesh, and they stand in the water dead to the world and alive unto God. And so you remember that uh, woman there, what is in the book of uh, 1 Timothy? Uh, Paul said, uh, uh, in regard to widows and one that's uh, too young, she'll wax wanton against Christ. And, and how that uh, she, uh, she liveth in pleasure is dead. Remember that passage? Well, she that liveth in pleasure is dead. So when we live in pleasure, the lust of the flesh, we're dead, dead toward God. And that's what he's talking about, dead in our affections. But he said, crucify your affections and lust. And so we're to put to death these lusts. And so when we're looking at here what Paul is saying in the book of Colossians, he's saying here, that you're the circumcision made without hands. 
This is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit of God that we, through this, the work of the Holy Spirit, will be dead to the sins of the world. We stand in the waters of baptism as dead men, and then we go under the water, the watery grave, and then when we come up out of the water, we come up out of the water symbolizing life, which now we're alive because the resurrection, we're alive unto God at that point in time to walk in the newness of life. Now, so what we see here, this is dealing with baptism, because now in verse 12, he said, You're buried with him in baptism, water baptism, wherein you were risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Now, let me just give you a free bonus here. When, when people talk about operation, they think it's surgery, but it's not. Amen. You know the word operation here? It, it is the Greek word uh, energia. Go ahead and do a cross-reference in the Bible and see how many times the book of Ephesians talks about energia. It, 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 let me give you the, it, it is the operation energia. The Greek word 1751 in your Strong's Concordance, it means the effectual working. And you, let me give you some scripture references where that same word is found. Ephesians 1.19, Ephesians 3.7, Ephesians 4.16, Philippians 3.21, Colossians 1 as we are, 1 verse 29, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 and 11. That's where that word is found. And so when we read here where it talks about you're buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation. God didn't come down and cut something out of your heart in a mystical way. That's not what the word operation means. It means the enabling power, the energy of the Holy Ghost of God, where he is able to come down and he is able to give you the ability here, the operation of God or the energia, as you're raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost of God, you can walk in the newness of life. Amen. And that's what your baptism demonstrates. Now, that, that is old-time Baptist teaching there. But yet we have the new Baptist uh, teaching where it is some mystical surgery. It didn't say surgery. Look up the word. Most of the people I talk to that will always use that argument have never looked up the word, what it means. They think surgery. You know, we have a business. We build aircraft covers. And we have an opportunity of talking to people all around the world. I mean, we sell covers to Israel. We sell covers to Russia. We sell covers to China. We sell covers to Japan, Italy, uh, Sweden. We sell them all over the world, all every state of the union. And we have an opportunity of talking to a lot of folks. Well, we talked to one guy, uh, sold him a cover that, that designed and built the, uh, the strut assembly for uh, Air Force One. Uh, we had Fox, uh, the film people. They called and ordered products from us. You know, the Beanie Babies, I have no idea what they are, but the guy that owned that called us, had a Cessna 310. He called in order to cover from us. My wife talked to all kinds of folks on the phone. She talked to the head surgeon in Alaska. He called, left a message. He called him back. He said, I can't talk to you right now. I'm in, the, I'm in the surgery room right now scrubbing up. I got an operation. I'll call you back when I get done. The chief surgeon. Well, that's pretty impressive. My little wife talking to everybody. Boy, she's just laughing, having a good old time. I'm out there working working my hands to the bone. She's just in there just chatting away and having a good time. But he's a surgeon. And you know, an operation is, an, you know what an operation is? It, it is the objective. It is not surgery. You'll have military that go on operations. And, and so here, the operation here, it is not surgery. So there's not a cutting away where God takes an invisible scalpel and cuts on your heart and takes away this invisible skin and casts it off. This is referring to the circumcision of the heart that from the heart, by the power of God, you die to self, you die to sin, and you're dead in the water and you raise up to walk in newness of life. That's what it means to be planted together in heavenly places. We're a unique people, a holy people. We're supposed to be, and that's called regeneration. And that is one of the ten things of the Cotton Grove Resolution and also of what Old Time Baptists believed. And notice verse 13, he says, And you being quickened together, and you, uh, and let me read this again. He said, And you being dead in your sins, in other words, you're dead to sin, the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And so we have this, this resurrection here and how that we are seated together in heavenly places. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. We've seen it there in chapter 2, but we won't go back to it, of Colossians. But he talks about principalities and powers. Now, Ephesians 3, he says, To the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places, he's talking about the New Testament church here, that's of a divine sanction, of a divine origin. 
And its people are redeemed by heavenly power. The Holy Ghost indwelling them is in them from heaven. Their Savior is from heaven. Their redemption is from heaven. The church that, that, that they're in was from heaven. The baptism they have experienced was from heaven. They are in a heavenly place. How else can he say it? How else could you say it? I mean, Jesus said the baptism of John wasn't of heaven. So he said it's heavenly. So here he's talking about the New Testament church. It is not, it is not of man origin is not of man. This is the divine sanctuary. It's a divine place. And, and it, there is divine protocol and process by to enter into it. And so this is a heavenly place. And uh, now the objects of this study clearly demonstrate that heavenly places is referring to the heavenly origin and nature displayed as an institution here on earth known as the church. Now the local assembly of scripturally baptized believers in the following example, we see the heavenly here on earth in different fashions. There are four different passages that use the phrase heavenly places. I have listed three of above for the study. There are four that are found in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a book deals with ethnic unity among other doctrinal subjects is uh, before we study the book of Ephesians, we will clarify the meaning of the heavenly places with the understanding we will have the proper uh, paradigm of the book of, uh, of the book of Ephesians. Now the manifestation of the image uh, is an example here, the manifestation of the heavenly image, and it's always done organically. Here's an example. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45 through 49. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which was natural. Afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth earthly. The second man is of the Lord, as, as which is earthly, such as are they which are earthly. And as it is heavenly, such as they also that are heavenly. And we have borne the image of the earthly. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Organic practice of heavenly things. This is where the heaven comes here. This is where heaven comes down. And so in heavenly places is where we are placed and seated together. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28 through 29. He talks about this passage. I remember... Years ago, I was in Kentucky, and there was a man who was, at that time, I think was in his mid-40s, in his high school sweetheart. His wife passed away of cancer, and uh, we sat together by the cemetery. And I didn't know this man very well, uh, but we were sitting there together, and he looked at me, and he said, Brother Woody, the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. He said, how can this work together for good? I really didn't want to say at the time, but he left out the other part of the equation in that verse is what he said. But let's read here Romans 8, verse 28 through 29. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the what? Image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now I read you already there in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49, where he said that, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We bear the image now. We are conformed to the image of His Son now organically. We are seated together in organic places which are heavenly. We bear the image of the heavenly in an organic fashion. And so it is practiced here. It is not somewhere we're up in some mystical world somewhere, yeah. floating around. Amen. It's organic base. And that's what, that's what Keats said. When he, you read all that he wrote, if you'll download his uh, The Glory of a New Testament Church, download that, read what he said, read what the Baptist believed, and again, the text, the precedent, and the history will confirm whether we are right or not, and if we're true Baptist or not. And, and then furthermore, we see here in the book of Hebrews, now the origin of your calling is placed uh, practiced in the world. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, follow along, listen if you will. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling... You are a partaker, which means actively engaged of the heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. He also mentioned there in the word of God, where he told us, he said, make your calling and election sure. Our calling is practiced organically, but yet it is of a heavenly origin. You practice it here. His kingdom is not up there. It is here confined within the walls of New Testament churches that are scriptural scattered around the world. These are the aggregate format of his churches. Not one church in itself contains all 
uh, the kingdom, but yet it is an aggregate that one day the, they'll all be assembled together to make the completeness of his kingdom, which will rule and reign with him for a thousand years uh, during the millennial reign. The book of John tells us in regard to his kingdom. He said, Jesus answered and said, my kingdom is not of this world. If, if my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. It's not that his kingdom isn't here. He was saying it's not of here. Remember, heavenly is the origin. It could either be in heaven itself or it could be on earth itself. It could be on Mars. It doesn't matter. Wherever it, The origin is, is what it means as heavenly, where it is from. Christ was heavenly, but yet he was here. We have the first Adam, the last Adam. One was spiritual, one was heavenly, one was earthly, but yet both of them occupied land mass here. And we, we see that uh, Jesus also dealt with the same concerning his disciples. Now, Jesus was in the world. It did not mean that he was of the world. He was in the world. The Holy Ghost was upon him in the world. However, all of these are heavenly. We are partakers of the heavenly calling here on earth. It does not mean it is the world as we partake of the Holy Ghost. It does not mean that the Holy Ghost is in the earth, but the Holy Ghost is from above. But yet it is here. He is from above, but yet here. In John chapter 8, verse 23, he said unto them, Ye are from beneath. I am from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. But where was he? He was here. So heavenly, here. We also find in John 6, 33, for the bread of God, which come down from heaven, he said, for the bread of God um, is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Jesus was heavenly. We see in 1 John 2, verse 15 through 16, he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He said, uh, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. This is what is worldly. This is from the world, but Christ is from above, yet he occupied space in this world. John 17, 6. He said, I have manifested my name unto men, which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now, with that, let's go to John 17 together and read verses 14 through 17. Now, here he is talking to his disciples, and notice what he says. He said, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Notice the equality of origin now. We are no longer of this world. In other words, we are from above. We are, we are from Him. We are of Him. We are in His institution. And how that we are, we are of, of God and we are given of God. And, and so we have what He said here of His disciples. He said, even as I am not of the world, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 18, let's jump over to that chapter. He said in John 18, verse 36 through 37, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. So again, He's not saying his kingdom is not here. He is saying he is not from here. His kingdom is not from here, but yet his kingdom is here because of Luke chapter 22, verse 29 and 30, Amen. Daniel 2, 44, and the day of these kings, God will set up a kingdom. We also read there in Luke chapter 22, verse 29 and 30, in the upper room there with the church, he says, as the Father had appointed me a kingdom, I appoint one unto you. Yeah. So the kingdom was appointed to an organic-based institution, that had heavenly baptism and was saved by heavenly protocol and program and were the children of the living God. And they were assembled together with scriptural baptism. They sat down together at a scriptural table and there they ate of the unleavened bread and they kept the ordinances of the Lord Jesus Christ and implemented New Testament law. This is a heavenly place. And so we are seated together in heavenly places. So you have to realize when you on the Lord's day come in, through these doors and you're sitting down, you are sitting in a divine institution. It's heavenly. It's divine. It, it, is a divine. it is a divine depository that God has placed His law, a place on earth where God has chosen and hewn out. You know, like in the book of Genesis when God planted a garden in Eden? You know, the garden was not part of creation. 
It was something that God planted. It was something that God put there specifically that Adam could go to. And although when man fell and how the garden was taken away and how that God had planted another garden. He had planted a garden with a vineyard called his church here on earth. And how it's a place we could go to. The Garden of Eden was a heavenly place. It was. It was made by God's own hand. I mean, specifically, that was not part of the creation account. It was something that God planted. He didn't just speak into existence, but He planted it. He made it. It was a special habitation there for Adam. And so this is our garden. Amen. This is our garden that God has planted. And God has placed here for us. Now, the heavenly... In Ephesians 1, he mentions again about heavenly places. Baptism places us into a heavenly place, known as the local visible church, to make known our new walk in Christ manifested. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and end this. It is getting late, and, and I want to end this, but understand. Now, there was a man sent from God, Brother Pastor Orlando had already dealt with this. The baptism of John, Wentz, was it from heaven or was it of men? They rejected the counsel of God against themselves and not being baptized of John. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 through 6. He hath raised us up together, that is baptism, and placed us together in heavenly places, that's church membership, a distinctively different place than any other organization on the face of God's yeah. earth. And that is to the intention, why? Now go to Ephesians 3 and we'll deal with the principalities and powers. Now the intention of why there is a kingdom here. Now, by the way, you know, the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. That's authority. That's law. That's government. That, that is executorship and, and all that Christ has given. So the kingdom of God is not in word, but it is in power. And, and we see here in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Let me go ahead and just uh, turn here real quick. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Notice what he says now. He says, To the intent that now under principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's the church, might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. So what we have is he's referring to the heavenly places, and he is, he's, he's talking about the, the uh, understanding what the church is. The church is the called out assembly, but to them have been deposited now the kingdom itself, and this is what makes it heavenly. And so this is the, to the intent that now principalities and powers be made in heavenly places, which is the church, is to be, this is where the power rests, and it's to be made known by the church, the principalities and powers. The same thing that was mentioned in the book of Colossians chapter 2, dealing with the subject of baptism. Now, what I'm going to close with this is this. When we look at the... The warfare, as we're in the book of Ephesians, you know, when you deal with the armor of God, people think it's all about you. It's your armor. It's not. It's a collective armor for the body, the church body. It's not you. It's not your armor. It's not your helmet, not your shield. It's the church's shield, and it's the church's sword. It's the church's helmet. It's the body. We, we always think it's all about us, but we're talking about a collective body wearing the armor, not you. And, and I'll show you this, and this is where we're going to end. So we see in verse 10, to the intent. Now this is the intention when we look at chapters 1 and 2. We come into chapter 3. And how that we're seated together in heavenly places to the intent that now principality and powers in heavenly places, this is the institution, the heavenly place, is to be made known by us, the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose, which he had purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now with that, go to Ephesians 6, hold your place here. We're going to look at two kingdoms. Now, would you agree with me tonight that we're translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son? We're translated, right? All right. And so we're in His kingdom. Now, the kingdom is not mystical, but it's visible. And every kingdom must have laws and ordinances and subjects, a scepter, and a king. So it has to be visible and physical. Now, watch this. So we have two kingdoms. They're at odds with each other. Ephesians 6, verse 12 he says here, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. All right? He says, Therefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Number one, who's he talking to? The church. All right? He's not talking to you. He's not talking to John. He's not talking to Bill. He's talking to the church. 
Now, when we look at to the intent that God has seated us together in heavenly places, and that His intent is that as He had placed us together in heavenly places, the intention is that in heavenly places, by the church, this power may be made known. The power of the kingdom. So let's, uh, let's compare verse 10 and verse 12 of these two chapters. So we look at verse 10, so let's pinch the pages now. In 3 verse 10, it says, To the intent that now unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to His eternal purpose. So here it is. To the intent that now unto, what's that word? Look at verse 10. To the intent that now unto principalities. You see the word? All right, that we're talking about in heavenly places, the church, it is the intention is to be made known. It is God's intention that we make known the, the principality here and the power. That's our, that is the intent that we're raised up together, seated together in heavenly places, that we will make this manifest. The church has power. The church is his kingdom. It, it is organic base, but it's of heaven. And we have laws and we have ordinances and how that it's an, it's an embassy. And so he hath raised us up together. It's called heavenly. It is the origin is from him. And so he has seated us together in this place with heavenly baptism, a heavenly savior. But yet it is all practiced in an organic fashion here. And as it is here, this will help us understand the value of this institution. So to the intention that now principalities shall be made known. Now go to Ephesians 6, 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities. Here we have principality against principality. And then we go back to verse 10 of chapter 3. Principalities and what? Powers. Go to 6, verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Against what? Powers. Against uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a kingdom against a kingdom. Yeah. The kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. And the kingdom of light is occupied as a heavenly place. It is filled with saved individuals that have had the circumcision of the heart by the energy of the power of God that stood dead in the water after they have exercised faith in Jesus Christ and have been become a child of God. They stand dead in the water by the power of God, dead to sin, dead to the kingdom of darkness. As they stand as dead men, they go in the watery grave representing death to the world. They come up out of that grave alive under the new kingdom and they walk in and set down together in heavenly places. Amen. This is why repentance always precedes the water. Amen. Repentance before faith, faith before the water, the milk of the word. And that's, that's the doctrine of Christ. But yet on the other side, on this kingdom, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Well, God's intention is principalities. We wrestle against powers. He said, I want you to show the power. That's why you're seated together. You're going to show the power, the gifts, the enabling of the Holy Ghost of God. So the church is heaven. It's, it's not, it wasn't started by Pastor Panetta. Yeah, that's right. There's only, you know, I like it when preachers say, I'm the founder. I founded this church. I like it. I found it. Why don't you go start a business and found something carnal and let God found his church. He's the founder of it. He started it. Jerusalem's the mother of us all. So who do we think we are? But something else, when we look at this armor, notice now he talks about the armor. It's not for you. It's for the collective body. And how that we're members in particular, and Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 12, you know, the, the feet, the eye, the ear, and all of us make up the body. Now look what he says in Ephesians 6, in verse 13. Because of this, now wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye, ye as a collective assembly, may be able to stand. In the evil day, and having done all to stand, stand therefore, church, having your loins girt about with truth, Hey, church, have on the breastplate of righteousness. Church, have your feet shod at the preparation of the gospel of peace. You are a collective body seated together in heavenly places to the intention to demonstrate the power in the principalities of heaven. 
That's why you're a kingdom. That's why you're an embassy. You're an aggregate of his kingdom here visibly, organically on earth. What good are you if you're invisible? What purpose do you serve floating around in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father? That's not in the Bible. Jesus is there. You're not. We're here. We're not up there at the right hand of the Father. We're here. Yeah, it's a peppy old song we like to sing. It's unscriptural. Church, above all, take in the shield of faith, wherewith ye, church, shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. And in you, church, take the full the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. You, church, which is the Word of God. You, church, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching as a church uh, thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And you, church, Cannot do this unless you understand you are seated together in heavenly places. Until you come to the conclusion you're organic based in your flesh and you're here and dwelt by the Spirit of God with gifts enabling us to fulfill His commission and His commands. We're not in heaven. And you know what? He's coming back and He's going to take what's organic here and He's going to use this to fill the whole earth and He's going to rule the world. The church here ought to be a showcase of the government of the millennial reign. That's why you ought to read Kiffin's uh, or Keech's uh, book here about the glorious church. That's the idea behind church government, church discipline. Matthew chapter 18, Matthew 16. Dealing with whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever is loosed on earth is bound in, uh, loosed in, in heaven. See, it's the organic connection we have with heaven itself. We're like an embassy such as in another country. American embassy has a hotline to Washington. Except if you're in Benghazi. Yeah, they just hang up on you. I don't get me started on it. See, when it gets late, I start getting a little mean. You know what I'm saying? I mean, right now, it's bumping near midnight for me. It's. I mean, I've, I've got two. My uh, son-in-law's a Marine. My son's a Marine. And uh, we have Air Force. And uh, we have folks. We love the military. And, and uh, you know, but, but anyhow, what's that got to do with anything? But... Uh, <laughs> But the, but the point is, we're in the embassy. You understand the importance of when you walk in here on the Lord's Day, you're not walking into a, 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 a membership club. That's right. You're walking into the church of the living God. Amen. You're walking into a heavenly place that God Amen. sent a man to baptize and sent a Savior to die for us Amen. and redeem us. And you walk in here, He's going to say, I put on the helmet. And you all pray together. You, you swing the sword together. You gird your feet together. You gird your loins together. You walk in truth together. You have that armor on as a collective body, all things in common, not a division. You don't have a schism in your body of false doctrine. You all have the same baptism and the same saving grace of God. You have all of that together and you serve together with that as a body collectively. The armor is not for you by yourself. You're worthless by yourself. You have to be collective. That is what the body of Christ is. It's not the body of Mac Woody or the body of Pastor Potter or the body of Brother Panetta. It is the body of Christ. Amen. That's all of us together. The body of Christ is not all saved. It's the collective body of individuals and local churches. Yes. That's the body. That's right. And so that is the intention of God. What we're to demonstrate so when someone talks about seated together in heavenly places, understand what it really means. Love your church. Thank God for it and the purpose of it. Father and Jesus.